excited. We're really excited to have you here. This is the Baker Institute at Rice University. How many of you have been on our campus before? Oh, almost. Oh, a good number of you. That's excellent. So we're glad to have you this morning again. Uh, so what we're doing today is we wanted to give you an opportunity to meet with Dr. Steve Chu, who's here today and this evening to give a presentation and talk about some policy issues. But this morning, he's here to talk about science and what it's like to be a scientist. Um, so a little background, I don't know if you know already, but uh, Mr. Chu, or Dr. Chu, is a physicist. Uh, he actually has done some amazing research, which led to his Nobel Prize on laser cooling. Is that right? I'm not a physicist. So. Uh, in addition, he's also had a lot of experience with the public and doing public policy. He actually was in D Washington, D.C. for several years and helped run the Department of Energy. So that's the organization that's kind of in charge of helping us become more sustainable and do energy research within the country. So with that, I'm going to leave it up to Dr. Chu to talk to you a little bit about himself. Okay, thank you. So, um, so uh, it's, it's absolutely true. I was in Washington for four and a third years uh, as what they called uh, US Secretary of Energy. That's a cabinet level position. It means that your boss is the president of the United States. And, um, and it was, uh, I had not ever done politics before that. Uh, I've not done politics since then, um, but I was chosen as a scientist. In fact, I was the first scientist to hold a cabinet level position in the history of the United States. So it's not a career that most of the scientists uh, end up in, uh, and it's, it wasn't a career. But, but let, me, let me start by talking um, about science and whether you will want to be science. How many people in the room think that maybe you might want to become a scientist? That's not bad. Now I'm going to end. How many people want to be lawyers? OK, equal number. Let's see, what are other professions? Doctors. Lots more doctors. That's, um, let's see, what else are profession? Police, fire, Engineer. engineers, engineers. OK, OK. Um, teachers. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so <laughs> a few. Um, anyway. Um, so I uh, am a scientist. I'm also a teacher. I was a professor for many, many years, uh, for a couple decades as well. But let me uh, just start by explaining a little bit of my background. Uh, my parents are Chinese. They came from China to go to graduate school here in the United States during World War II. OK, think about that. That means this guy's really old, <laughs> which you probably noticed anyway. Um, but, um, and they went to graduate school, and afterward they began to raise a family, but in 1949, the communists took over China, and they could not go back to China, even if they were thinking about that, because if you have PhDs, advanced degrees, and you go back to China in those days, uh, uh, you would not uh, end up very well. Uh, you would be killed. So, in fact, um, um, and so they had to start in, in the United States. Um, although they came from well-to-do families, uh, all that money was lost. Uh, anybody could, could escape would have to escape because it was so. So essentially, they came in as immigrants with zero, uh, and. Uh, I had to make life in the United States. And so they raised a family, three brothers, uh, spoke to us only in English, uh, because they thought if they talked to us in Chinese, we would get confused. And they thought, we're going to speak to you only in English so you can do the best you can in school. Now, I have to say that they didn't realize at the time that you can speak to children in two or three or four different languages. And by the time they're two or three years old, they can be fluent in all those languages. Uh, kids are very, very smart. Um, but they didn't know that. The fact that they only spoke to us English did not help us really much. We all were confused. <laughs> but, um, but in any case, uh, that's what happened. Um, 
uh, education was highly valued, but we were not very rich at all, and, and they had to make do. So that's how life started with us, uh, the three brothers. And um, now, I presume most of you have brothers and sisters, right? Okay. Uh, how, many, how many are, now, I was a middle child. I had an older brother, middle child, and younger brother. And let me just tell you, I, to draw your sympathy, uh, if you're in the middle somewhere, it's not a good place to be. <laughs> the older one gets all the parents' attention, <laughs> and the younger one gets their attention for a different reason, uh, the baby of the family. Um, and uh, that was also true in our family. The older one was expected to do really well in school, and it was very studious. And my parents thought I should do as well in school, but didn't have as high a hope. My school teachers thought I should do well, but, um, but it was hard competing with my older brother. Uh, he went through, it was a public school. He went through the public school and set the highest cumulative average in the history of the public school. Okay. <laughs> and um, that was pretty tough to compete with. And so in the ninth grade, I dropped out for four uh, three or four months. I just didn't want to go to school. I didn't want to compete with my older brother. My parents just got very distraught, uh, trying to convince me to go back to school. And finally, I went back to school in May and took the final exams and then muddled through. Um, and then my younger brother, then I went to college. I applied to some good schools, uh, Princeton and Yale but was rejected. Uh, I applied to a few others. University of Rochester accepted me. Um, uh, I was rejected because I did okay in the standardized test, but I had a few Bs in German, well-deserved Bs. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know German. Uh, I um, did well in some classes, but I didn't well uniformly. My older brother, he was much more organized, and so he would do what it takes to get A's in everything, or A pluses, really. Um, my younger brother had even worse time of it. So I go to college and begin to do well. My brother's in Princeton. I was the first child in the extended family not to go to Princeton or Harvard. So I was the failure of the extended family. So if you can imagine this, okay? You know, I know, I meet a lot of kids who are the first kids in their family to go to college. My wife's the first child in her family to go to college. Uh, and so both have, have their own issues. If you're the first to go to college, you know, the rest of your family doesn't know what is this new culture. If you're first not to go to Princeton or Harvard, the rest of the family says, we don't know this culture either. <laughs> but anyway, my younger brother, uh, was very, very um, taken aback by this. Got lots of pressure from our parents, you know. Gilbert's doing well in school. Stephen's doing well in school. Why aren't you doing well in school? So he dropped out of high school at the end of his junior year and never finished. Bummed around with some pals and went all around. My parents were in that time in Los Angeles area. He went back, uh, had some high school buddies in uh, Garden City, which we grew up, it's a little town in uh, Long Island, New York, and did clever things like, how fast can you go through the New York subway system on one token, go through every stop, and take the least amount of time, and got a Guinness Book of Record for that. It takes about 27 hours. <laughs> uh, and he beat it by, you know, 30 minutes. And he actually had to get the Guinness Book of Records people there taking the ride with them. Um, but he, he, um, he decided he maybe wanted to go to college and he talked his way into UCLA even without a high school diploma, without the support of the high school. Now he's a bright guy and he got a PhD at the age of 22, went on and got a law degree at Harvard, even though I didn't have a high school diploma. So why am I telling you this? First I'm trying to tell, make you feel really sorry for me. 
<laughs> you know, my older brother um, got a PhD in physics, and then after a couple of years of postdoc, he went back and got an MD PhD at, at Harvard MIT. So he had an MD, he had a PhD. My younger brother had a PhD and a law degree, and the best I could do was get a PhD. So you should be really sorry with me by this time. <laughs> Uh, it's a very distinguished family, but it's, it's, I'm, I'm also talking about this because there's pressure. Uh, and there's pressure to do all sorts of things, and they come from different things. In my family, there's pressure to do very well in school. In other families, there's pressure, you've got to get a job because the family needs an income. In other schools, there's pressure from your friends to do things, and then you're going off in this direction, and your f other friends don't. You know, so what, why are you doing that? And, and so in the end, what I found, and what my younger brother found was, there was so much pressure to have us do something that we were rebelling against it, even though it may have been in our nature to do it. And in the end, what I had to find, and what my younger brother had to find was, you're gonna have to develop some internal compass and you're going to have to decide what you think is important and valuable for you personally. Your parents give you a lot of values. I hope your teachers give you a lot of values. Your classmates, I hope, give you values. But in the end, it's going to have to come from you. And so, um, and that turned out to be very good. So, uh, I'm not going to tell you about the rest of my life. You know, I was a reasonably good student and, and so on and so forth. Um, um, and uh, now, uh, what are the things that's of interest? Uh, maybe two more things. I'm going to throw open the questions. One is, uh, how many people here know what a Nobel Prize is? Okay. Anyone want to volunteer? Of the yes. Uh, so is this Nobel Prize given to um, prize people, um, prize um, educators, or? professionals who are so greatly in their field. Right. That's good. That's close. But it's close because it, there's a difference. A Nobel Prize is given for a, a specific contribution. So you don't get Nobel Prizes for lifetime achievement, like Lifetime Achievement Award in, in, uh, in uh, Academy Awards. It's more like uh, you get an Academy Award for best actor in this picture. And so a Nobel Prize is given for a specific achievement that you've done in science. And it could be a series of achievements that add up to a big achievement, but it's, it's something like that. And there are, there are, and it's in different fields. There's one in physics. There's one in chemistry. There's one in called medicine or physiology. There's one in literature, and there's one in peace. Um, so it's uh, the first three in science, physics, chemistry, medicine, physiology, Alfred Nobel wrote in his will, he had five wills for this prize, and, uh, and the last will he added literature and peace. Um, but th those are prizes, they're given each, mostly each year, sometimes they miss, uh, if, if deemed not worthy, but it's essentially every year. And um, since most of you heard it, see, uh, I don't have to explain that much except one thing. Um, uh, it's one of these things where when people I knew got a Nobel Prize, I said, oh, that's nice, and didn't think much of it. And so when I got a Nobel Prize, I called up my mother. Uh, they, award, they announced it in, at noontime in Sweden in their early weeks in October. And um, I eventually got a phone call and uh, said, congratulations, you've just uh, been awarded a Nobel Prize. So I thought it was like 4 o'clock in the morning. So I said, I'll wait a few more hours and call my mother. I called my mother about 7 and said, Mom. So hi, Stephen. Uh, I just thought you'd like to know I just got a Nobel Prize. <laughs> Five seconds and said, that's nice. When are you going to see me next? <laughs> <laughs> Then she calls back a couple hours later and says, Stephen, it's true. My neighbor said it's true. You did get a Nobel Prize. <laughs> How's that for confidence? Uh, uh, so um, 
Uh, she didn't believe it. And she, uh, she was always actually expecting my brother to get the Nobel Prize. <laughs> so that was... <laughs> 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 you think it's, but this is how bad it was. I mean, this is how much of a back sheep it was. I mean, <laughs> she had a classmate in China who said, oh, he's so smart. Everybody thought he was going to get a Nobel Prize, and he did. Um, and, and she was, you know, she's much, much older now, and she's reminiscing, and people who get older start to reminisce. And I was there with my wife, and I, I kind of looked at her and said, um, and I bet you never expected me to get a Nobel Prize, again, a long silence. <laughs> and then I said, and what about Gilbert? And I said, oh, you're better in politics than Gilbert. <laughs> At that point, <laughs> my wife is getting really irritated. <laughs> but uh, in any case, um, all right, let me tell you what I got it for. Um, I got it to use lasers to cool down atoms to very, very low temperatures. So now, before I go further, I have to explain to you, first of all, what does cool down mean? So take the <coughs> molecules in this room. They're moving around at a certain speed, so they have a certain energy, average energy. Some are going this way, some are going that way. In fact, they're just bumping into each other. And they're going at the speed of supersonic jet planes. In fact, that's why the speed of sound is what it is. Um, it's a little bit, the speed of sound is a little bit slower than the average speed of the molecules that move around. And we thought, wouldn't it be neat to be able to hold on to atoms with a laser beam and just move it anywhere you want and just hold it, let it go, do stuff like that? Wouldn't it be cool? And in order to do that, since these are zipping by the speed of supersonic jet planes, you could calculate that they had to go really slowly. How slow is really slowly? About as fast as an ant walks. And if they're moving really slowly, you know, like this, then you could hold on to them. And um, so my colleagues and I developed methods to get them really cold and to move really slowly, and then you could hold on to them. Now, you're probably thinking to yourself, this is a Nobel Prize, you know, come on, what's it good for? And um, I told that to my boss, I was at Bell Labs at the time, and I said, Bill, you won't believe this, but we now can trap atoms. And I, he, I looked really excited, and I said, no, we can trap atoms, this is, this is neat. And he looked at me and said, as a good boss, he'd say, okay, that's neat, what are you gonna do with them? And I said, I have the foggiest idea, but it's really cool. <laughs> and he looked, you know, you know, we hired this guy? So, no. <laughs> so anyway, so let me tell you why it's so cool. When you do this, and you make the atoms very, very cold, and it's in a vacuum chamber, so there are no other atoms to bump into them. You drop and they drop like rocks. They literally drop like a rock. Or just gravity. And so you can toss them up, and you go up, and they turn around, and they come down. And in that path of coming up and coming down, it turns out you can make a better clock. So that's the one thing I knew. So we made a better atomic clock. Now, atomic clock is a very precise clock. It's a clock that we use that's the heart of the global position satellite system. When you know where you are, you know, you get out your smartphone, you're actually getting signals from satellites, three satellites. And we know exactly where the satellites are, and those timing signals tell you where you are to within a few meters anywhere in the world. The heart of that is an atomic clock. If you make an internet call, which is any call, you call on your cell phone, and it goes from a, a microwave tower to some fiber, and it goes anywhere around the world and goes back, and this packet of information gets switched, the synchronization of all those computers is done by the atomic clocks. So atomic clocks are everywhere. And they're the heart of communications now and for the last couple of decades. So we made better atomic clocks. We made better sensors. We, turns out we can measure the acceleration, acceleration and rotations just about better than any other technology. And so uh, the graduate student who first did this work started a company. He's a professor also, but he started a company 
where a little thing like this, based on these cool, very cold atoms, you can put eventually on a chip, and you can that thing will know where it is anywhere around the world without talking to anything outside there. Just by measuring the accelerations and rotations, it's called an inertial guidance system, you know where you are. So imagine that when you're a baby, mother takes you a few steps this way, a few steps this way, a few steps that way, and you just add it up. And for your whole lifetime, you may know where you are to a meter. Cool. <laughs> okay? Uh, that these technologies are going to be useful. They're going to go in a satellite, and they're going to be useful to um, measure changes in glaciers. You know, as the climate changes and glaciers start to melt, you can measure changes in glaciers. As we run out of water, um, uh, you, you guys are in Texas, you, you actually have a water problem in northern Texas, right? Uh, the Ulagao aquifer is running dry. This actually shows up in satellite. You have an, a satellite orbiting over Texas. It actually orbits over the entire uh, Earth, not just Texas. I know Texas is special, but it's part of it. <laughs> and if, if there's a little change in the acceleration of gravity down here, it makes the orbit wobble. And, and it makes the accelerate because of the change in the acceleration due to gravity. And we now measure depleting water tables due to the, the changes in the orbits of satellites, these very precise satellites. And it can see changes in glaciers that are a few millimeters over two kilometers thick of ice. When it melts a couple of millimeters, we can see that now. And what we're finding is the glaciers are melting and we're running out of water. Uh, but the great thing about this is you can find it, we're running out of water, not by, you know, the farmers know you're running out of water because their whole wells are running dry and they have to drill deeper. But there are other places where you can now look for water, but you're, it tells you how much you're running out of water, not just from reports from farmers. Okay. So it turns out that there are a lot of applications to this technology that I helped uh, invent and develop that I never dreamed it was going to be useful for those things. I simply never dreamed it. And, and then eventually, when I got to Stanford University, I said, we can hold on to atoms. We can do all these wonderful things. Can you hold on to a molecule of DNA? Or you can hold on a bunch of other biological molecules and measure when they push and pull against each other. Can we actually measure the force that one molecule exerts on another molecule in a biological system? And the answer is yes. And so that's started another set of a cottage industry. So to, you know, that it opened up a lot of new things in biology. So, so it turned out to be useful. I had no idea it was going to be that useful. Uh, but it drove me into biology. And now I spent all my time doing biology and medicine, not physics. Um, but it's something that uh, was quite unexpected uh, in how how, um, you know, how useful something would have been. And that, for me, is a great joy of doing science. Uh, you do something, and you think it'll be kind of cool. That's the only reason you should go into whatever you go into. You're going to have to have fun at what you're doing. And, but then when it, when it affects other people in a positive way, when it touches other people's lives, then it gets to be really cool. And so, so I'm very glad I became a scientist. Um, I um, didn't disappoint my mother <laughs> in the end. She uh, finally accepted the fact that, uh, you know, I don't know what happened to this guy, but he did something. <laughs> uh, the other two brothers are doing quite well. Uh, one's a professor at Stanford in the medical school in biochemistry, very distinguished professor there. The other one is a lawyer who's a very, very famous lawyer, uh, one of the most famous patent attorneys in the United States. Uh, and so we all, the two younger brothers, overcame our handicaps and were able to do OK. Um, uh, I've talked way too long. And so I just wanted you to just answer questions, or you might have questions about future careers and other things. But you know, just throw it open. 
Don't be shy. Yes. Oh, you don't have to clap. Thank you. <laughs> she was wondering what are we <laughs> Yes. What did you do when you worked in the presidential cabinet? What did I do? All right. So, a good question. Cabinet members have what are called agencies. So, you know, there's three branches of government. There's the Supreme Court, there's Congress, and there's the executive branch. The executive branch is the president, but it's also a bunch of agencies that do a lot of the business of government. For example, in energy, uh, my department, we run a few things. We're responsible for funding a lot of the physical science in the United States, the research. We're responsible for funding a lot of the uh, energy research that can develop new sources of energy. We're responsible for uh, the nuclear arsenal. Now, how did that happen? It's because during World War II, a bunch of physicists were asked to help make an uh, atomic bomb, an H-bomb. That was after World War II. And that group of national laboratories that were created to do that during World War II became actually, during Carter's administration, was enveloped into a new department called the Department of Energy. So it was only because of, a, historically, some physicists uh, worked on the Manhattan Project. So we're responsible for the nuclear arsenal, the design of the bombs, the maintenance, everything else. Uh, the Department of Defense is responsible for, you know, delivering, <laughs> if we ever have to deliver. But it's a partnership. Um, we're, in part, we're responsible. There was a lot of... Uh, uh, stuff that happened during the makings in, in that Cold War period, and so there's a Cold War legacy, so we're responsible to clean up the mess. Um, but it's mostly a science funding agency that funds research that will help America prosper, uh, that will actually help us develop new technologies. Okay. So it's an agency, you know, Congress will vote some money, the president has to sign it, but then it's up to us to decide. And there are little buckets of money, but then we have to decide how to spend it in the wisest way possible for the taxpayers. Uh, during my time, 2000, beginning of 2009 to end of April 2013, the economy was in free fall, and so there was an extra amount of money given to a bunch of departments, about $34 billion where we were asked to stimulate back the economy and do things. And so we use that money uh, to start new things, to, um, uh, we invested in the building of large wind farms and solar farms um, because uh, the financial community didn't want to loan money for that. And so we said, we'll, we'll do this. We loaned to Ford Motor Company because they may have gone bankrupt. Had we not gone alone, we loaned to Tesla. They would have gone bankrupt if we didn't give them a loan. We loaned to a few companies that did go bankrupt, like Fisker and Slender, which is a solar company. Uh, on balance, um, if you consider all the losses and all the gains in our portfolio, we'll make the government about $5 billion, which we weren't trying to make them any money, which I'm kind of break even. But, but so it's an agency. now. Other cabinet agencies, like U.S. Department of Agriculture, they inspect meat, right? And they do other things like that. And so, so a lot of the government is kind of invisible. You know, you inspect bridges, you inspect meat, you run the air traffic controllers. And we, we fund physical sciences. We run what are called the national laboratories, which are a bevy of scientists and engineers that do things for the national good, that, as well as research. Um, the budget each year is about $26 billion. You know, when you have $26 billion a year to spend, you cannot believe how popular you are. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody wants to be your friend. So does, does that help? OK, good. Yes? All right, so like I know you got a Nobel Peace Prize and all this happy. 
I mean, what now? What are you, uh, what are you up to? Are you still in the cabinet? What other the project? Okay, so the question was, okay, you've got a Nobel Peace Prize and everybody's very happy. <laughs> and, <laughs> and what are you up to now? Um, okay, look, first let me just say that it's a Nobel Prize in physics, not peace. But no, but everybody makes that mistake. Many senators and congressmen make that mistake. And, and so I quietly think to myself, no, I got the real Nobel Prize. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, before I answer that, I have to tell you a story. Uh, I got, I, would, I was a graduate student at Berkeley and then a postdoc, and they made me assistant professor. Uh, but they said, since you spent all your time here, we'll allow you to take a leave of absence. You can go anywhere you want for two years, and, or you can start now at Berkeley and start your group. Or, but since you spent eight years at Berkeley, we decided we want you. So we want you to take the job, but after that, you can go anywhere for two years. It was very special treatment. So I said, fine, that's great. I'll take the job. And I went to Bell Laboratories. And, um, and I got to Bell Labs. This is a great place. How many people heard of Bell Labs? Not very many. OK. Bell Labs was the research arm of the American Telephone and Telegraph Company. It's a super, super good research arm. They've made some inventions you may have heard of. The transistor was invented at Bell Laboratories. The laser was invented at Bell Laboratories. The silicon photocell was invented at Bell Laboratories. Radio astronomy and satellite communications were invented at Bell Laboratories. And the list goes on. 15 people who worked at Bell Laboratories got Nobel Prizes. And a lot of people, the CCD camera, which is the precursor to the, your cell phone cameras, that was invented at Bell Laboratories. So I go to Bell Laboratories, and there's this old guy who teeters in. He goes in his office, and he sits there for a couple of hours. And occasionally, he comes out, and he goes back, and then he just leaves. And I was a young Turk, you know, in the 30. And uh, I finally asked my boss, he says, who is that guy? And he says, you don't know who that guy is? No, no, no. He says, oh, he's Bill Fan. He invented a way of making silicon germanium super pure. So that once you made it super pure, you can make transistors. Before that, you couldn't make them practically. And he says, let me tell you a story. There are these two cavemen. And they're looking, and there's this old caveman walking by. And one of them says, who is that guy? And the other caveman says, you don't know who he is? No. He invented the wheel. And the other guy says, yeah, but what has he done lately? <laughs> now, <laughs> what have I done lately is you're going <laughs> So <laughs> So, so uh, I was a cabinet member until the end of 2000 uh, end of April 2013, I uh, wanted to come back and become a professor. I didn't want to be boss of anything, a president of a university, nothing like that. I just said, I just want to go back to being a professor. And I'm going to, maybe if I can think of any really new ideas, I'd like to start a research group again. And so that's what I've done. Uh, what am I doing? I'm working on some issues in biology and medicine that could so it's sort of new ways of measuring how things work in biology and medicine, which could lead to, I think, a lot of things. But um, it, and I'm also working on better batteries for electric vehicles. Uh, that stuff is turning out that it looks like it might work, which is very exciting, because um, it would really help uh, optical microscopy and uh, help many, many researchers uh, discover new things. Uh, just like my Nobel Prize helped many, many researchers discover new things. And uh, there was another Nobel Prize that's been awarded by scientists who took what I did and applied it to something else. And I'm hoping that there will be three or four or five other Nobel Prizes awarded to people who've taking stuff and using something else. That's uh, 
knows you really made some effect. Uh, so I think it's going to work. I don't know. We've only been at it a year and a half. The batteries are, uh, the batteries, what we're trying to do in the batteries is to try to invent a battery that has maybe four or five times the energy per unit weight of today's batteries, can charge maybe 10 times faster. And if we can do this, you can have, you know, a Tesla costs a lot of money. It's a very good car. It goes 260 miles and it takes mm, 20 minutes you can put in another 140 miles on the car. But it costs over $100,000. So it, only rich people could afford a Tesla. <laughs> it, it's true. Uh, uh, um, there are a lot of Teslas around where I live. <laughs> a lot of rich people where I live. But, but what you would like to do is invent a car, an electric vehicle, that costs $25,000 same as a normal car, uh, that can go 300 miles, and they can charge 200 miles in five minutes. And at that point, you probably want to buy an electric vehicle because it's going to be almost as good and in many ways better than a normal car. Uh, and so that's the goal. Um, and let me tell you, the idea of taking out your smartphone and it's really hot in Houston, cool down the car before I get in, and it calls you back in uh, one and a half minutes, the uh, car's ready. We're ready when you are. So you dash out, go into the car, it's nice and cool. You can't do that internal combustion engine car, right? Because the carbon monoxide is not good. Um, so uh, also you can, electric motor has a lot more torque. And if you, want to accelerate quickly, you can accelerate much more quickly in an electric vehicle. Even the lowly Nissan goes zero to 60 in seven seconds. Now, I don't advocate that this is what you should aspire to. <laughs> the Tesla goes zero to 60, the powerful one, in 3.2 seconds. This is like crazy whiplash too fast. <laughs> I, I, uh, <laughs> it's just, you know, I, I got a ride in a Tesla that went zero to 60 in 4.5 seconds, and that's something, if you didn't have that thing in the back of your neck, you would have... <laughs> so, 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 all I'm saying is, is that if you can get a $25,000 car that can go 300 miles, and much less gas, you know, you know, it's much cheaper to charge electrically and to pay for a gasoline bill. Uh, that would be a good thing. So we're trying to work on this new battery. It's a new design. Uh, I'm, I'm hopeful it will work. Um, but let me tell you, that doesn't mean it will work. You know, I mean, yeah, it's a 50-50 chance, which is extraordinarily high, but you know, dozens and dozens of very smart people are trying to make stuff like this. Uh, when you do research, you have to be optimistic. When the real odds might be 10 to 1 against it working, you have to think that there's a real chance. Uh, and that's true in life in general. But, uh, so um, that's what I'm doing. Uh, and, uh, and I didn't invent the wheel. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? What type of students? Oh, all over the map. Uh, right now, I'm teaching freshmen. Uh, they're freshmen taking an engineering course, uh, electricity and magnetism. Uh, so we have two, three general groups of students at Stanford, ones who know they want to be physics majors and they have, there's a very advanced physics class. There's one for engineers and maybe some physics students who haven't had as much uh, background. And then there's one for people who want to go to medical school or humanist types who just want a physics class. So I'm teaching uh, the one for engineers. Uh, and I've taught graduate classes, uh, undergraduate classes, upper division undergraduate, freshmen. Uh, I teach them all. Uh, they're all different. I'd like to teach them all, um, um, but right now freshmen. Um, uh, next year I might design a new course on energy and sustainability. Uh, that, you know, I'm sure the freshmen would like. Uh, I used to teach graduate classes 
that were very different. You know, this is a quantum mechanics. I had a few people, some professors would come to my lectures. It was very cute. Uh, uh, and they would, uh, and then these are, you know, like famous professors in physics would come to my lectures. Uh, and, you know, I, particular, particular, I thought it was particularly good. They, they would email and said, Steve, that was wonderful. You now made it super clear. So that's cute because the graduate students don't send you email messages like that. <laughs> but uh, Sergey Brin taught, took my, he was in electrical engineering. Sergey Brin was one of the founders of Google. Larry Page and Sergey Brin were graduate students at Stanford. Sergey Brin took my quantum mechanics class, and he said, all I could remember is it was hard. <laughs> and, um, but he liked it. Uh, another person who was in the business school took it, and he said, you changed my life. I said, how? I said, I now am doing a company that does quantum communications. I was going to do something else, and you got me really interested in quantum mechanics. So I learned quantum mechanics. So that was kind of cool. There's someone in business school who decides I'm going to take this guy's quantum mechanics class, and then he says, this is really cool, and changed his career. I didn't change Sergey Brin's career. You know, $26 billion, physicist. No. <laughs> uh, yes? Ah, okay. So the question was science was science my only interest or were there other fields I'd like to pursue? Um, no, there were other things I liked. Um, I did sports. Uh, I played tennis. Uh, no, we were poor, so so I couldn't afford tennis lessons or anything. So I got an old tennis rack and tennis balls and banged the ball against the wall. Our high school had a brick wall, you know, and so I taught myself tennis that way and got good enough to get on the team. And then after that, I could get some coaching. Uh, so I played tennis. I played a few other sports, enjoyed that. I played music, uh, not very well. <laughs> uh, well, not, yeah, not very well. Uh, 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 I was interested in mathematics. I was actually interested in English and history. Okay, I, I liked English and history. Um, uh, I didn't like German. <laughs> but, uh, so I liked a lot of things. Um, uh, in the end, uh, when I went to college, I decided not to Joined the tennis team there. I was good enough to make it was from the University of Rochester, so it's not like Stanford. Stanford, if you're on the tennis team at Stanford, you're really good. I had a, a young lady who did her honors thesis with me. That means you do research for one or two summers and write an honors thesis in physics. And she uh, won the NCAA championships in doubles and the it got to the finals NCAA in singles and lost in singles. So she could have been a pro. And um, I walked down to the tennis court with her and because all my students in my group were eager to see what would happen. And, <laughs> and after the second game, we decided not to score. <laughs> she was very good. Uh, but she went on and got a PhD in physics at Harvard and went on to do a postdoc and is now an assistant professor at UC San Diego doing very well. In fact, she got a prize for her work as an assistant professor. The last year I was in the Department of Energy and I was handing out the prizes. So, it was, uh, no, it's not an old boy network. I mean, it's someone else selected the recipients. So, so she did very well. But she, she could have been a professional tennis player, but she decided to go into physics. Um, I decided to go into physics. I decided not to do math because although I liked it, I was always afraid I would wake up one day and say, you know, there's only about 30 people in the world who will appreciate what I'm doing, truly, if you do mathematics research. Could be 50. It isn't 100, okay? It's, it's a very small subset of people. And I said, and so 
I'd rather be a mediocre physicist than a mediocre mathematician. And if you're a mediocre mathematician, maybe only 20 or 10 would care what you're doing. Okay, and you, it'd be very hard to explain to people. So, so I stopped uh, uh, thinking of a career in mathematics. Even though it was funny because in math you can go much faster. By the end of my sophomore year, I finished all the undergraduate courses in mathematics. I was taking only graduate courses. And, and I still said, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do this. Um, because I didn't want to wake up one day and say, you know, what am I doing? At least in physics, you're doing science that other people can build on, and you can touch many people's lives, uh, but that's how science works. You know, you do a little something, someone else does it, someone else does it, and it ends up affecting people's lives. And math is not exactly that way. Okay? Yes? Uh, Stanford? Uh, it's a, it's a Stanford University. Uh, it's, it's on the West Coast. Have you heard of Stanford? <laughs> okay, so uh, it's a little Cowtown College. <laughs> no, <laughs> uh, and so I, I teach at Stanford. Yes. Um, well, I think you answered it. Was there a defining moment or experience in your life that made you want to become a scientist? No. <laughs> it was a lot of little things. Uh, I think it was expected. My, my parents, my father especially, his, he comes from a very scientific background. His oldest sister was a scientist. His other sister was a you know, scientist. He, he was a chemical engineer, which is but a pretty science-y chemical engineer. Um, he would, I remember when I was in the second grade, he would me outside and say, Stephen, here's some advice. Don't get married until after you get your PhD. <laughs> so, but, so there was an expectation um, uh, to go into science, but, uh, but in the end, uh, you know, my brother, my older brother is in science, but science and medicine, my younger brother didn't. Um, uh, I, I would say, you know, uh, it grew. I had a very, very good calculus teacher in high school and a good physics teacher for two years. It, and that really helped make it go into physics or math in college. And uh, when I was in graduate school, you as you go into graduate school, after you, you've generally done with your classes after about the first one, one and a half years, and you start doing research with, in a group, a research group. And I chose someone who I thought I liked him. He was a great teacher. He didn't have a lot of money. Uh, his group had gone down to zero, but I thought I admired him for the way he taught and many other things, and so I started to work with him. And he, he was, uh, he taught me a lot of other things rather than just, you know, how to do research. He actually taught me, uh, he was a super honorable person. He, he worked side by side with his students. It wasn't that he was a big shot and they were the little munchkins. Uh, we would clean up the lab together and sort all the loose screws that we got off the floor together and do everything together. We would do work in the machine shop together. Uh, I tried a little bit to try to do that with my people too. That, you know, you, you're not the hair professor up here and all the other people down there as your slaves trying to do something. Uh, you just do the work together. Um, so that was good. But all these things reinforce the fact that uh, it's not only the subject matter, but it's the social aspect of doing science. And let me, let me emphasize that. The social aspect of doing science was really very good. For the most part, scientists are trying to get new knowledge. And for the most part, there are you know, grabby, pushy people. But for the most part, they're very honorable, uh, meaning they're not out there to get ahead at the expense of their colleagues. They're not out there to, to make sure that you know, they're noticed, not someone else. I mean, there's a bit of that goes on, but not, not, and nothing like in the business world at all. 
Uh, and the, the thing is, if you're caught being at any way intellectually dishonest, it is no good for you. Okay, this, you're, you, don't, you will not have, uh, you know, there are some, you know, occasionally that leak through for a while, but, but you, cannot, you cannot be a successful scientist and do something that is deliberately deceptive because the whole fabric of science finds this stuff out. Because if you get a famous result and report it, and if it's significant, people will say, well, I need to duplicate that to see if it's really true, and if it's true, how to build from that. And if you fake something that no one else can duplicate, your reputation's gone. And occasionally you, re you, know, you hear about this in headlines, but it, but it happens so, so infrequently. So that whole fabric of science enforces an honesty which I really like. I really love the fact that you fundamentally have to be honest. There's no choice. And, but, but most people are honest because that's what they believe in. Okay? And that's that, so the sociology of being a scientist was one of the things that I really like. Um, um, sometimes in Washington, D.C., when you're in front of a TV camera, you may not say something you truly believe. <laughs> I, you know, you might have suspected that. <laughs> uh, right? And, and, you know, and, and so you don't, it, you, that doesn't happen in science. Okay. Yes? Have you ever done a science project that put you in awe or surprised you? Uh, yes. Um, those are the most, the question is, have I done a science project that put me on and surprised me? And yes, um, those are the things we really cherish. If you do an experiment that's set out to show something or see or measure something and it works, that's good. But the really cool stuff is, oh my gosh, what happened? That wasn't supposed to happen like that. Scratch, scratch, scratch. Okay, <laughs> the surprises is what we live for. The surprises is how you actually get to take significant next steps in science. Is when you know you live for a surprise. You live to to say, oh, you know, experiment wrong answer. What's going on? So of course you did the experiment wrong. So you think hard about it. And say, no, the experiment's right. Okay, then it's time to scratch, scratch, scratch. And that's the most fun. That is really the most fun. And laser cooling and trapping, we had a scratch, scratch, scratch moment. I had done the experiment, and it came close to the theoretical minimum temperature you can get to. Well, there was a little bit, it could have been a little colder, but I was so clever, I said, well, here's a theory, theoretical reason why the temperature should have been pretty close to the minimum. I was dumb, I uh, had a clue. It took another group to discover that the temperatures were actually colder. Not 10% colder, like four times colder, which actually was probably in my lab at the time. And um, so after this other person did it, you know, a couple of other people said, yep, it's true, using essentially the same method I used to measure the temperature. And then it was a scratch, scratch, scratch. Uh, why was it working better? than it should have, uh, four or five, six times better. And uh, so I shared the Nobel Prize uh, with two other groups. Uh, one group discovered that the temperatures were colder. And, and another group and I concurrently came up with a theory that said why it was colder, as well as the first work, which got those really low temperatures. So, but that was fun. That was really fun because, oh my gosh, it's working so much better. Other things on the biology side, can you know vaguely, you know, what, you know, studying individual molecules in biology, why would you want to do that? Because you know there are billions of molecules in each cell. And so I came with a very simple philosophy. Um, I can't use this analogy in this room because you're all women, but in normal, let's say in the city of Houston, roughly half women, half men. 
And suppose you're from Mars and you're looking at the telescope and you're looking at the people in Houston and you can't differentiate between men and women. But you can measure certain physical properties, right? Um, you know, average length of hair, things like that. Um, you find that, um, uh, you know, men on average, sorry, the population on average has one testicle, one ovary. You're half men, half women. <laughs> on average, that's true. Okay? The reality has nothing to do with the average. Okay? The reality is two and zero, or zero and two. And, and so I said, said, if you can measure how biology works on looking at many, many thousands and thousands of individual molecular systems, the average behavior may not be the same as, as the individual behavior, and it turned out to be absolutely true. I would be surprised if it came out another way, but it, it turned out that just that notion, uh, look at look at molecules as individuals and they begin to act like individuals even though, heck, they don't really have personalities. Uh, they take different pathways, they do different things. And so that, and then we understood why they do that. But, but that's, that was poisoning yourself for surprise, but, and it was a surprise if you think back in the way people thought about it 30 years ago. But now it's not taken as a fact. You've got to look at individual systems, individual cells. If a skin cell and a skin cell and a skin cell, they behave differently on the same organism. And so the slight differences in how cells behave turns out to be very important also. And, and so if you develop the technology to look at that, it turns out you discover new things. It's all about discovering something new uh, and the surprises. Yes? Have you ever failed at a science project? Mm -hmm. Pardon? Have you ever failed at a science project? Have I ever failed at a science project? You betcha. Uh, maybe three or four times, four times out of five, I, if things won't work. Uh, so you might be asking, if you have that high probability of failure, then why are you here? <laughs> and, and why would people want to fund you? And the answer is, how to fail. Um, if you want to do something really new, there's going to be a reasonable probability of failure. If it's really new. You know, if you're doing something that's sort of like everyone else, you just follow whatever they do. But, but I really like doing super new things. So there's a very high probability of failure. It's way greater than 50%. It really is like 75%. Um, so what do you do? You, you go in and you say, hmm, if this is going to work, these four things might have to happen. And what's the one most likely to fail? You do that first. That's the exact opposite of most people. They say, you got these four things to work. I'm going to work on the stuff I know will work. Okay? And they work on the easiest stuff first. And then they at last take the hard part. That's the wrong way to do it because you could spend a year or three doing the easy stuff, and then in the end it didn't work. You can spend a few months doing the hard thing, and it didn't work, and you scratch and try to figure out a better way to do it, but after a while you say, no, I don't think it's going to work, and you move on to something else. So if you fail, and I, you do fail, especially if you're bold, fail quickly and move on. Okay, don't do the easy stuff first. Do the hardest thing first, and then the thing that's most critical, the thing that's most new. And, and so that's one of the things is how do you teach people to fail uh, quickly, fail, fail quickly, learn from the failure, pick themselves, dust themselves off, and move on. Uh, too many times you see students who try and they try and they try, and three or four or five years they're trying and it's not working, and even some scientists. And you don't want to spend four or five years failing. Uh, that's, that's, that's a real downer emotionally. <laughs> uh, for, and, uh, and you may lose funding. Uh, yes? Even in science, how much of your career is spent reading and writing? How much of my career is spent reading and writing in science? <laughs> um, writing is very important. Uh, I cannot stress to you how important writing is in science. 
Um, if uh, the inventor of the laser, big, it was a very good friend of mine, Art, Art Shallow, and he said, we think we're scientists, but we're really authors. And the way you can tell is if you stop writing, you're not going to get any funding. You stop doing experiments, they may still give you money for a whole bunch of time. There's something more important than that. The, your ability to write clearly, to explain, <laughs> to explain clearly what you've done so that people can read your paper, uh, is a window into the mind of the author. If a person can't write clearly, they cannot think clearly. End of story. Writing is the exercise in order to help you begin to think very clearly. It begins in English, in history papers. It doesn't begin in science. <laughs> okay? Be able to write clearly. You read a book and say, and what is, and, and tell us what you think the author was trying to say, and you have a suspicion. How do you develop what you're talking about in a very clear way? And so I spent a lot of time talking to my graduate students and postdocs. You think at postdocs, you know, they're 25 years old, 26 years old, they know how to write. Many of them don't know how to write. They don't know the idea of a paragraph. They don't know the idea of how to develop an idea very clearly, to make it very, very clear and very linear thinking. And, and in teaching them how, no, why would I teach them how to write? Because I'm really teaching them how to think. Okay? So I spend a lot of time teaching them how to write. Uh, you know, I'll sit down with them and I'll say, okay, this is not the way you should be. And then, you know, it, their paper will come back all red. But it's not actually good enough that it comes back all red and cross out and read. Say, so said, no, now we're going to go through this and I'll tell you why I did this. And, you know, year by year it gets better and better. A few people know how to write naturally, but it, most people do not. And uh, that is one of the most valuable things I can teach people as a scientist, believe it or not, is how to write. It's all about how to think. So, anyway, so, yes? Do you have any advice for people who aren't sure what they want to do yet? Uh, no, that's good. Uh, <laughs> no, the reason I say no is it, you don't, you're young, you don't have to decide what to do yet. You know, really, you know, you know, you're going to hopefully go to college and college is going to be a wonderful experience and take all sorts of classes and in most colleges they don't want you to declare a major for two years. They insist you don't. Okay? And so you have an experience where you can begin to choose your classes and you can choose what excites you. And it's all going to be all about that. What do I get really interested in and what am I willing to stay up the wee hours in the morning, uh, I say to people, you know, if you're going to throw away the flower of your youth, you know, you better like what you're doing. <laughs> you know, if you're a scientist, you know, you're, you're, it takes you, you know, your middle, late 20s and you get a PhD and you get a couple more years postdoc before you know it, you're 30 years old, uh, you better like what you're doing during those years. Okay, now that's not going to be for everybody. Uh, but, but for those people who want that route, yeah, you, you just like what you're doing. So, so, you know, take advantage of the fact that when you go to college, there's a big menu. Talk to the other students. The other students, well, it's now online now. You, you can decide who are the good professors, who are the not so good professors. Uh, but occasionally, once you get an interest in the subject, a bad professor might not be a totally disastrous thing because they could be so bad that you have to learn it on your own. <laughs> I, I had one in his sophomore in college, uh, and the fact that he, that person was so bad I had to learn it on my own, and I started kind of talking with the other students about you know, what it was really meaning actually made me into a better scientist. Uh, because, if, you know, because in the end, what do, what, what, do you do, what are we trying to do when you uh, teach people in college? We're trying to teach them how to teach themselves. Your college experience should be one where when you go out as an adult, lion's share of the things you're going to face in adult life might not have much to do with college except one thing, and that is 
that you know how to read, hopefully you know how to write, and you can teach yourself uh, new things. Because it's the teach yourself new things and the ability to express yourself clearly, which is the foundation of any education. Okay. Someone up there likes what I'm saying. <laughs> yes. Do you think those, uh, those surprise moments that lead to impactful discoveries, are they hard to get? Or do they happen frequently? Uh, I think they happen frequently, but they're m mostly overlooked. Um, meaning that you know, I've missed a couple times in my laboratory where nature's saying it's not exactly right, but you think, well, I'm so certain because it should have been this answer, the theory says it should have been this, that I overlooked it. And so I have another favorite expression that I try to teach all my students and postdocs is when you're doing an experiment, you have to arrange it to let nature talk back to you and listen. Let me give you an example. I have a very bright postdoc who uh, was highly touted uh, when he was a graduate student in Illinois. I got some prizes when he was a graduate student because he was that good. And he came into my laboratory and he's doing these experiments on bacteria. And he was analyzing the data, but it was very, very uh, elaborate data analysis. And I said, no, no, Max, don't do it. Just look at the thing. We have an image of this. Don't try to do any fancy data analysis. Just look at the picture and do the data analysis, say, for different times. Just look at it. I said, but it might be this. No, no, no. You don't understand. Just look at it. And spend a lot of time looking at the raw data with your own eyes. Do not make any analysis programs to look for something you think might be happening. OK? Now. Most people don't approach science experiments that way. They think they're very clever and they're going to do some data analysis. And, the, and, then, they, and then you see in the data analysis a set of numbers or graphs. So no, 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 no. Look. And maybe your brain can see something that then you begin to say, oh, you know, that might be interesting. And so to teach people that is amazing. Uh, people don't look. They say, oh, are we going to measure this? You're going to measure that? I can write a program to do this, and I don't have to look at the raw data. And, and that's the most important thing. And that's why things are overlooked. So I would say the mass majority of things have been discovered repeatedly and overlooked. Uh, and so you have to set yourself up to, uh, nature's talking, listen, <laughs> right? If there's something that doesn't quite fit, don't think, oh, it's because you know, and you know, I'm still kicking myself a few times. There are a few other Nobel Prize things that I'm just kicking myself. I missed uh, because I wasn't listening. So as I got older and older, I got better and better at listening. Okay. Yes? What were some challenges you had to overcome when you were creating the laser that could pull Okay, so the question was, what were the challenges I had to overcome when I was creating the laser that can cool the atoms. Um, uh, well, the laser was a commercial laser. It had to be adapted. There was a thing that I had to add to the laser in order it wasn't commercially available. And, uh, but that was an engineering thing that was coming out from a different field in optical communications. So I went to the engineers who are working on this and say, I want to make such and such and they, for this reason. And they said, oh, yeah, this is, you know, here's the book, here's this. And so I went and did it. Uh, there was not really any super hard thing technically for that experiment. There are other experiments I did where it demanded much more sophisticated instrumentation that I had to work very hard, that you, know, you couldn't buy it. Uh, uh, but that particular experiment, ironically, could have been done 10 years earlier. And it wasn't, or certainly five or six years earlier, but it wasn't, uh, which was good. I mean, that's my, you know, you, that's, you know, you, 
this is happening now in the last two years. And said, why haven't people been doing this? And they could have done it five years ago. And so, so we kind of scratch and look and find it and said, couldn't find anything, still can't find anything. He said, okay, we can do this. And, and so, so all I can say is, thank God that other people are as dumb as I am. <laughs> and have overlooked it. Well, I had an excuse. I was working for the president for four and a half years. But, <laughs> but, but, um, but sometimes it's not a technical challenge. It's just seeing something in a different way. Or, or bringing two or three things together, in the case of laser cooling, that were from different fields, that I can say I can make this work. And what I'm doing now in biology is bringing three or four things from different areas um, that a biologist or a biophysicist might not know. But it, you know, just so it. But there are other times when I, I would work a couple of years to make some instrument that you just simply could not make, and other people, you know. So it's a mixture. Yeah. Yes. Hi, my name is Brittany. Um, what what subjects do you think are most similar, like compare most similar to science? And what subjects do you think contrast science? Okay. Uh, what subjects are most similar to science? Well, engineering. <laughs> Electrical engineering is not too far from science, uh, from physics, let's say. Uh, there, you know, I think my kind of science is rooted in a very quantitative science, They're heavily, you know, mathematics and things like that. Uh, there are other types of science that are, are not that mathematical. And you could say mechanical electrical engineering has much more m mathematical foundation closer to physics than uh, psychology, for the most part. Or even many other forms of biology. There's no fundamental set of rules and laws. Uh, and so there's, there's one thing that, you know, how mathematical is it or not. There's also, uh, and, there, and the reason we, we would love to have fundamental laws that, that we can have in biology that are really mathematical, but we're not that advanced yet. So although it's the eventual goal, we don't have them. And so what you do is you hunt and gather and you just try to figure it out and eventually something will come. Uh, the fields least, you know, it's different. Um, I, I would say, you know, this may sound a little bit radical, but uh, since I did you know, did have an interest in humanities. Um, I would say that in some respects, studying history and studying literature are closer to science than uh, some social science fields. <laughs> yes? No, I'm, I'm, you, can I explain what I mean by that? Because that sounds really radical. Okay? Uh, in, because of the way you do things in history, if you're a good historian, what you're really trying to do is trying to figure out what happened. And so you have to weigh all sorts of evidence and do all this other stuff. And sometimes in social science field, you may have such a strong preconceived notion of what the answer should be that you know, it clouds your judgment. And, and so, but, but there's a common lore link to all these things, whether it's social science, science, or humanities. You know, can you approach this subject with an open mind? And, and, be, and, and the opinions you form are based not only on your life experiences, but also on evidence. Okay, so there was a... I was wondering, is there anything internationally going on that affects what you choose to experiment on in science? Um, for me, no. Um, not directly. Um, I think... Science uh, is a very international endeavor in the sense that if there's some exciting science, it does cut across all countries uh, with the proviso that uh, different types of science require different financial investments in countries. But in the very expensive high energy physics, for example, uh, no single country can now afford to build the next accelerator. And so there are international collaborations. In what I am doing now on developing new biological probes, they're using materials called rare earths, 
China owns about 95% of the rares of the, of the world. Rares have an application to be used in displays, video displays, you know, TVs, things like that. And so there's a lot of research being done on these materials to make them useful for displays. And, but I wanted to make them useful for bi biology, which is going kind of the other way. Displays, you have cheap diodes that make it, you know, you can see blue, green, yellow. So you can get beautiful color display. In biology, you want them to go in the near infrared where the light can penetrate the furthest through tissue. And so the, the lion's share of all the papers was focused on what we call up conversion. You have two photons to make it blue, green, yellow, and different classes of particles, where I wanted to go the opposite direction. So I benefited from a lot of the work being done for practical reasons, to make nanoparticles for that, but they were going the other direction. And that's what I'm, when I said, you know, why weren't they thinking of this five years ago? It turns out that these things are going to be beautiful for biological probes, uh, but for totally different reasons, for actually for biological diagnostics, not for color displays. Uh, because, and it's in the infrared, you can't see it with your eye. Um, but, um, uh, but uh, because China had a lock on the rare earth materials, a lot of the papers coming out were from China uh, for financial reasons. But so that may have something to do with it. Not really, um, you know, because what we need for our work is, you know, it's such a small quantity, it doesn't matter. Um, uh, so I think, but there is sometimes, um, you know, things get in fashion, things get out of fashion. I personally don't like to work on things that are in fashion. Uh, you know, once they get fashionable, then a lot of smart people want to work on it. And then, and so I said, well, so I, so I better, I better start a fashion. <laughs> because, you know, it's not as much fun to compete with, you know, it's the same problem I had with my older brother. It, it <laughs> I'd rather start a new field. <laughs> they can be with smart people. <laughs> um, so I think we're up, our time's up right now, and I wanted to thank Dr. Chu for coming here today, and all of you. Hey, thank you.